Continuing our study of congruence modulo n, we now introduce something called a complete residue system. One thing we haven't done yet is discuss equivalence classes. So since modular equivalence is an actual equivalence relation, it partitions the integers into different equivalence classes. So any equivalence relation on a set will partition that set into what are called equivalence classes. Each set, everything in that set is related to the other things in that set by the relation, and this is what defines the equivalence classes. So suppose S1 through SK are the equivalence classes under the relation modulo n. So they are a partition of the integers. Every integer belongs to one of these. Then suppose S is just a collection S1 through SK lowercase, where S1 lowercase is drawn from the set capital S1 and so forth. Then S is called a complete residue system modulo N. So capital S is a complete residue system modulo N if it contains exactly one element from each equivalence class. Now we haven't formally established that there are finitely many equivalence classes, but we will do so very shortly. So a complete residue system modulo n is just going to be abbreviated as CRS mod n, and that's frequently how I'll say it. When a is equivalent to b modulo n, in other words, they have the same equivalence class under congruence modulo n, we'll say that a and b are in the same residue class. Residue class is just a sort of specialized term for talking about equivalence classes under this relation. So if we knew what the equivalence classes were, then any set formed by taking one element from each equivalence class would be called now a complete residue system. But how many equivalence classes are there? The notation above really suggests there's finitely many, S1 through SK, but let's actually formally establish that. The question stands then, how many equivalence classes are there under congruence modulo N? As it turns out, the division algorithm provides a very fast and immediate answer to this question. Once n, a positive integer, has been fixed, every integer can be written uniquely in one way of the form a multiple of n plus a remainder r, where 0 is less than or equal to r is less than n. So every integer a is equivalent to exactly one number out of the list 0 through n minus 1. So 0 through n minus 1 forms a complete residue system modulo n. Every integer is equivalent to one of them, so we have, it, we have definitely accounted for all of the residue classes. And no two elements in this list are equivalent to each other modulo n because they all cover different remainders under the division algorithm. So I don't have more than one number drawn from each equivalence class. So this has exactly one number drawn from each equivalence class. It is a complete residue system modulo n, 0 through n minus 1. This is what we will call the standard complete residue system modulo n, or standard CRS modulo n. It's just the integers 0 through n minus 1. But it's not the only complete residue system we're ever going to use. It just happens to be the most straightforward under most circumstances. So let's take a look at another way to describe what complete residue systems are. So the following are all equivalent. We are complete residue system modulo n, a set with one element from each equivalence class mod n. Or for any integer, there is exactly one element of s that x is equivalent to mod m. Or s has exactly n elements and no two are equivalent mod n. So these are all equivalent, meaning any one of these conditions is the same as the other ones. So the first two are really just a matter of terminology. Okay, the original definition was contains one element from each equivalence class, but everything is equivalent to something. The set of things it's equivalent to are called equivalence classes. So that second condition says for any integer, there is one element of S that, I, that X is equivalent to mod N, meaning there is one element of S from the equivalence class of X. So we have one element from each equivalence class. So the first two are really just a rephrasing of one another. It's also immediate that any complete residue system mod n has to have exactly n elements, because from the division algorithm, we see that there are n equivalence classes. And since a complete residue system has one element from each class, it must therefore have n elements. A complete residue system cannot have two elements that are equivalent to each other because then we would have taken two elements from the same equivalence class. And since it only contains one element from each equivalence class, a complete residue system must have n elements and no two of them are equivalent mod n. 
And by the pigeonhole principle, if we had n elements and no two of them were equivalent mod n, since there are exactly n equivalence classes, if no two of them are equivalent mod n, no two of them belong to the same equivalence class, we would have to have one from each. So all three of these conditions are equivalent. If we want to show something as a complete residue system mod n, generally the fastest way to do so is to say it has n elements in it and no two elements are equivalent modulo n. That will immediately show that it is a complete residue system modulo n. So now let's establish the following theorem. Suppose S is a complete residue system mod n, meaning it has exactly n elements in it, so I list them S1 through Sn. These are just integers, they don't have to be the standard complete residue system, this is just any complete residue system mod n. Suppose K is an arbitrary integer. Then I take a new set by taking the old set S and adding the same K to every element of the original set S. This is also a complete residue system modulo n. So if you start with a complete residue system mod n and you add the same number to every element of it, you are still a complete residue system mod n. Well, it definitely has n elements in it. There they are, s1 plus k, s2 plus k, and so forth. So the set s prime has n elements. What we need to show is that two of them cannot be equivalent mod n. As we saw in the previous slide, if you have n elements and no two are equivalent mod n, then you have a complete residue system mod n. So suppose you pick two elements out of our set S prime, one of the original S's plus K and another of the original S's plus the same K. I can subtract numbers from modular equivalence and I end up with SI is equivalent to SJ mod n. But the original set was assumed to be a complete residue system mod n, so two different elements cannot be equivalent mod n. Therefore, in my new set, two different elements cannot be equivalent mod n. So since we have a set of n elements and no two of them are equivalent mod n, we indeed have a complete residue system mod n. So this is a quick and easy way to generate new complete residue systems mod n. Start with one complete residue system mod n and add the same thing to every number. A more interesting result, however, suppose we start with a complete residue system mod n and now we have an integer that is relatively prime to n. Then if I make a new set by multiplying every element of my complete residue system by that same number k, that is also a complete residue system mod n. The condition that k be relatively prime to the modular base n is absolutely crucial. In the previous theorem about adding the same number to every element, there was no such restriction. But here, now that we're multiplying, it's absolutely required. So we know that if a set has n elements and no two of them are equivalent mod n, it is a complete residue system mod n. S prime definitely has n elements and there they are, they're listed out. So all we need to do is show that two of them can't be equivalent mod n. Pick two elements from S prime, k times one of the original s's and k times the original, and suppose that they are equivalent mod n. Since k is relatively prime to the base n by assumption, I can cancel it from this modular equivalence. Okay, and because it's relatively prime, I don't have to divide out by anything. So what we end up with is that si is equivalent to sj modulo n, but the original set was a complete residue system and therefore two elements are not equivalent to each other. So in our new set, they can't be equivalent either. So this is a more interesting way to generate complete residue systems modulo n, multiply by something relatively prime to n. Now let's take some example problems. Construct a complete residue system modulo five so that every element is relatively prime to two. A very frustrating student error that I see all the time is to do the following. Zero through four is the standard complete residue system mod five but zero, two, and four are not relatively prime to two. So because we wanted every element to be relatively prime to two, just take them out and you're left with the set one and three. Now this is a set of elements that are relatively prime to two, but it only has two elements in it and a complete residue system mod five has to have five elements in it. So this is definitely not a complete residue system modulo five. Here's one possible solution. 0, 2, and 4 are sort of the problem elements. From the standard complete residue system, 0, 2, and 4 are the ones that violate our desire to be relatively primed to 2. But 0 is equivalent to 5 mod 5, 2 is equivalent to 7, and 4 is equivalent to 9. 
Therefore, 5, 7, and 9 being relatively prime to 2, I simply replace 0 with something equivalent to it, with something from the same equivalence class. So instead of uh, pulling 0 out of this particular equivalence class, I pull out 5, because that's an odd number. It's relatively prime to 2. Instead of 2, I replace it with the equivalent 7, and instead of 4, I replace it with the equivalent 9. So now I have five elements, all of which are not equivalent to one another mod 2. Because from the original standard complete residue system, I simply replaced 0 with 5, 2 with 7, and 4 with 9. Here's another solution. Since 2 is relatively prime to 5, I can multiply the standard complete residue system mod 5 by 2 and still be a complete residue system mod 5. So instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I multiply everything by 2 and I have 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. Now this might seem like we've done something very bad. Our desire is for everything to be relatively prime to 2, and now everything is even. But I can now add 1 to every element of the complete residue system and still be a complete residue system. So instead of 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, I have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Now when adding things to a complete residue system, it's worth pointing out 0 is not equivalent to 1, 2 is not equivalent to 3, 4 is not equivalent to 5, 6 is not equivalent to 7, and 8 is not equivalent to 9, modulo 5. However, as a set, this contains one element from each equivalence class, and so does this. 0 is equivalent to 5, 2 is equivalent to 7, 4 is equivalent to 9, 6 is equivalent to 1, and 8 is equivalent to 3. So in the second solution, what we did is we said, from the standard complete residue system, the goal is to get relatively prime to 2, aka odd. So first, multiply by 2. 2 is relatively prime to the base, so if I multiply a complete residue system by 2, I remain a complete residue system, and then add 1 to every element and remain a complete residue system. And now I've made them all into odd numbers. Let's take a look at another example. Construct a complete residue system modulo 10 with exactly three negative values. Well, the standard complete residue system mod 10 would be 0 through 9. I can pick any three of them and subtract 10. Since I'm working modulo 10, subtracting 10 is the same thing as subtracting 0. So let's pick, for example, 4, 7, and 8. If I subtract 10, I get negative 6, negative 3, negative 2. So I simply replace those with their equivalent negative values. And now I have a complete residue system mod 10 with exactly three negative values. There are, of course, many other solutions to this problem. This is just one. Let's take a look at another example. Construct a complete residue system modulo 8 consisting entirely of even numbers. Well, in the last example, we multiplied everything by 2 from the standard complete residue system, and that made a bunch of even numbers. But we can't do that here. In the previous example, we were working mod 5. 2 is relatively prime to mod 5, so multiplying the standard complete residue system by 2 was fine. But 2 is not relatively prime to 8. So we aren't going to be able to multiply the standard complete residue system mod 8 by 2 and still be a complete residue system mod 8. So that's not going to work. In fact, nothing would. There is no such thing as a complete residue system mod 8 consisting entirely of even numbers. A number is even if and only if it's a multiple of 2. This is the definition of even. So suppose S is a complete residue system mod 8. Since it contains something from every equivalence class, and 1 is certainly in its own equivalence class, S must contain something equivalent to 1 mod 8. Therefore, X is a multiple of 8 plus 1. But if we're assuming everything in this complete residue system is even, 2 is a factor of x, but 2 is also a factor of 8k. So if 2 is a factor of x, because x is assumed to be even, and 2 is definitely a factor of 8k, then 2 must be a factor of the difference, but just by subtracting 8k from both sides, we see that x minus 8k is exactly 1. 2 is definitely not a factor of 1. Therefore, x can't be even and be equivalent to 1 modulo 8. So there cannot possibly be a complete residue system mod 8, which contains all even values, because it would have to contain something equivalent to 1 mod 8, and such a number cannot possibly be even. We were able to make a complete residue system of odd numbers modulo 5, but we weren't able to make a complete residue system of even numbers modulo 8. What's the important distinction? Here's a theorem. 
For any two positive integers and then a third integer k, there exists a complete residue system modulo n so that every element is equivalent to k modulo m. Notice that this m is what I want elements of the complete residue system to be equivalent to, but the complete residue system is modulo n, if and only if the two numbers are relatively prime. So first assume that they are relatively prime. Suppose you take any complete residue system mod n. Since m is relatively prime to that, I can multiply and remain a complete residue system at modulo n, and then I can add the same thing to every element. And now notice that each element here is of the form m times something plus k, a multiple of m plus k. Therefore, all of these are equivalent to k modulo m, and that was the desired complete residue system to construct. Conversely, let's assume that we have a complete residue system modulo n, so that every element of the complete residue system is equivalent to k modulo m. What we need to show now is that n and m are relatively prime. So whatever the greatest common factor of those two numbers is, let's call it d. Any complete residue system modulo n would have to have an element x equivalent to k plus 1 modulo n. Okay, everything is equivalent to k modulo m, because we've assumed we were able to construct a complete residue system so that every element is equivalent to k mod m. However, one element would have to be equivalent to k plus 1 mod n. Because we're a complete residue system modulo n, there has to exist an x equivalent to whatever we want. Specifically, we want x to be equivalent to k plus 1. So, x is equivalent to k modulo m, so it must be a multiple of m plus k. But x is also equivalent to k plus 1 modulo n. Therefore, x is k plus 1 plus a multiple of n. Well, if both of these are equal to x, they must be equal to each other. Now, if I just move some stuff around and cancel a k out of both sides, what we end up with is n times y minus m times z is equal to 1. What we have here is a multiple of n and another multiple of m added together or subtracted, but whatever, to equal 1. Since d is a factor of n and d is a factor of m, d must be a factor of this linear combination of n and m. Therefore, d is a factor of 1, and the only positive factor of 1 is 1 itself. So n and m were, in fact, relatively prime. So if the goal is construct a complete residue system modulo n so that every element is equivalent to k modulo m, you can only solve that if those two bases are relatively prime. And furthermore, if they are relatively prime, this first argument tells you exactly what to do. Take a complete residue system modulo n, multiply by m, since that's relatively prime to the base, this remains a complete residue system mod n, then add k, Adding the same number to every element does not change the fact that you are a complete residue system, but everything here is now equivalent to k modulo m.